one of the best articles published uh, by Giorgio Parisi. Uh, he's a theoretical, theoretical physicist. And he said, scientists are no longer seen as neutral, neutral observers whose findings emerge from dogged research and peer review. They are just another uh, face of the distrusted elite. And then from the same text, another quote is, scientists must talk about their mistakes and doubts as well as their successes. I hope this is true and it's not misinformation. Uh, I just wanted to start with this uh, uh, context. And um, when I was thinking about uh, what should I present, I just wanted to bring the context from uh, low-income countries such as Pakistan with our work and experience in the communities. Um, and focusing more on the supply side, because uh, the equation of vaccine uh, has the supply and the demand side. And I, I thought it is important uh, that we uh, we focus on uh, 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 whether we have a resilient and responsive health system uh, to address the issues which are existing and address the issues that can emerge uh, in the case of a pandemic or any other outbreak. And in developing countries, we have many of such situations. Um, I, I changed my slides, but I think they probably were not updated. But anyways, um, when, I, when I started my work in uh, immunization on vaccine trials, um, soon I realized that there is a lot that need to be shared with the communities where we work uh, compared to what we actually plan to do. Um, we had a typhoid vaccine school-based introduction in Pakistan, uh, in Karachi. And when we started working with the schools, with the communities, with the parents, we realized that there, there are many questions uh, and those questions need to be addressed. Um, and th that led us to uh, going back to the drawing board and develop a formative research uh, to develop a communication strategy. Uh, so this was one paper that we published back in 2013. Uh, and I remember when I attended um, EDVAC back in 2005, seems like a long time ago, um, the whole EDVAC was very concentrated on uh, talking about the, uh, the vaccine development. Uh, and I realized that there is really less talk about um, who is it for? And I think it was uh, addressed in the morning also. Uh, and we there was there was just one presentation on communication in in 2005. And I'm really happy to see that uh, there is there is a lot of discussion around uh, the communities and the people who actually we work for. Um, this is another poll that has been done, and uh, it shows uh, um, a lot of uh, I mean uh, the distribution of vaccine acceptance uh, globally. Um, the global vaccine acceptance, according to this poll that was conducted in 2020, is 68%. But what I want to highlight is that more than one third of the healthcare providers were hesitant uh, um, uh, for vaccine uh, for vaccines. Uh, a lot has been talked about this, so I'm not going to go into the detail uh, on the um, demand side factors. We look at uh, age, education level, trust in the government and health system awareness and knowledge and religious belief that affect uh, the vaccine uptake. Um, similarly, uh, there are conspiracy theories, misinformation on social media, perceived risk, previous vaccination history and experience, and cultural beliefs. There is the, we all know a lot about this, and um, I, I just don't want to um, uh, bore you with all this information. We are very well aware about it. But I just wanted to highlight that going back to the... the, to the um, uh, map that I showed, um, we do highlight a country based on an estimate, uh, but we also have to understand that all these factors are distributed among uh, communities. They can be randomly distributed, they can be clustered. So that's why it's really important for us to have the information that whatever strategies that we have to address or improve vaccine coverage or vaccine improve vaccine acceptance, it is important for us to know that where are these people located and how to reach them. Um, so from the demand side uh, factors, supply side factors that affect vaccine acceptance are the excess, the healthcare provider's influence. Patients who receive a strong recommendation from healthcare provider are 4.6 times more likely to, be get, to get vaccinated. So that 
highlights the importance of how health what is how important healthcare workers are uh, when we talk about um, improving vaccination coverage. Uh, cost of the vaccine, definitely a lot of these vaccines uh, in low income countries are free, but the vaccines that that also creates a challenge because there is no market for the other vaccines that are also needed. Uh, and since these vaccines are coming through Gavi or any other funding source, um, there is less access to other vaccines. For example, we talk a lot about flu. Now the discussion about universal uh, life course immunization. Um, uh, flu is not available in the routine immunization program, so people have to purchase, so that also becomes a barrier. Um, the presence of community health worker who promote health education and vaccination can improve vaccination rates. Uh, and I have a slide that I'll, I'll share with you later. Uh, and the training and motivation uh, can also lead to 20% increase um, uh, in vaccination rates. And uh, I would like to uh, focus um, from the information, from data. Um, for the past five years, we have been working with the uh, Childhood Immunization Program, which is called uh, Federal Directorate of Immunization in Pakistan. Uh, and zero dose children are a topic of discussion across the board. Every organization, agency, the governments are really concerned about zero dose. Um, but uh, can, can you go back, please? Mm, maybe. Okay, all right. um, when we started working in two communities in, um, um, in an area between Pakistan and Afghanistan, um, we, we were reported the zero dose uh, children. So if you look at these two bars, uh, I don't know which one is the point. Yeah, uh, so starting from 2022, this, these uh, data show uh, the um, every time when there is a polio campaign, they collect information on zero dose children. So what I have always struggled and I have talked to, to our staff and to the immunization program that uh, assuming, I mean, this was the numbers in January of 22 that total children who were zero dose in this district of Bannu was 4,107. There was a coverage for 50, of 56%, so these children were vaccinated, uh, and it reduced to 2,311. But then when we go to the next uh, SNID in February of 22, this jumps back to 5,183. And I'm unable to understand that where are these zero dose children coming from? Um, is the birth cohort increasing? Are these missed children in the first place? But this keeps on all the way. And uh, the numbers never go down below 4,000 in this particular district, and they are working in another district also. Um, it's, it's a similar pattern. To me, it is, it, it is the capacity of the health workers or the health system within the district to try to calculate the numbers, look at the numbers, and try to confirm the numbers. Uh, we um, have addressed um, some of the um, issues through our, our project, and a lot of this um, vaccine hesitancy or resistance comes from uh, the information gaps. And, and the health system's uh, response, if it is not immediate, it could lead to something really disastrous, especially in terms of in, uh, in the times of uh, campaigns. Uh, so we started on uh, initially working in these two districts uh, for routine immunization, improving uh, the vaccination rate because we, um, the federal director of immunization requested us that the two districts in this uh, between Afghanistan and Pakistan, the because of the security issues, uh, etc., the number of uh, children vaccinated is really low. Um, so we, they needed our support to work with them to improve the va vaccination. So we used a, a comprehensive approach. A lot of this has been mentioned by other speakers previously uh, um, around multi, uh, governance, motivation, skills, community engagement, uh, oversight of the EPI, supportive supervision. Uh, and in one year time, we have been able to mm. increase uh, vaccination rates by 7% uh, in one district and 15% in the other district. Uh, in the past five years, uh, since our um, uh, PhD Global has been working with the Federal Director of Immunization, we have been engaged in, in, in four major campaigns. Uh, and the Typhoid 
conjugate vaccine was introduced back in 2019 in the, initially in the province of Sindh and then uh, in a phased manner uh, in other provinces. Uh, so this is an example from Khyber uh, Pakhtunkhwa uh, province of uh, Balochistan, uh, Pakistan, uh, where on the very first day uh, a video was circulated um, in uh, in the community um, showing that uh, a children children uh, a child has fainted, uh, and later on the the, um, the information spread so quickly uh, that. Um, in, in social media and other information sources, it was reported as a child has died. And that really impacted the, the, uh, the whole campaign. The similar story uh, happened in Karachi when it was introduced in 2019. Uh, in, bo um, in both the cases, when we did um, an in investigation later on, we found out that... Um, the child was not even vaccinated. It was the fear of receiving the vaccine and the child fainted uh, and parents were not happy about it. And then it, this information was used um, to just um, uh, damage the whole campaign. Um, but why did this, these two episodes became so big that they could have um, really stopped the, the, um, the campaign and the introduction? was because the health system was did not have a mechanism to address this, this kind of um, uh, an episode. Um, and that is really important. Although we worked with the government to develop those SOPs, uh, but those trickle-down um, capacity did not happen at the lower, lower level. Like the vaccination teams did not know what to do and were they, were, were they only... Uh, they were only worried about their own safety, so they left the whole place and and uh, let the information spread fast. Uh, that resulted into a lot of damage. It took a good one week to overcome and bring the coverage back and the confidence back to 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 a level that was uh, to to have the intended um, coverage. Just check. I think this is not the uh, the revised presentation that I shared. Um, so uh, I have some slides that probably I'll share with you guys. They are not here. Um, um, realizing this, uh, all this information on our experience working with the communities, uh, we noticed that there is a huge training gap, uh, and uh, um, although. A lot of this uh, information is communicated to uh, within the health system uh, to the senior level people who are in charge of uh, vaccination program. Uh, but uh, the the frontline health workers, the community health workers, the vaccinators uh, are not trained enough to respond to what happens um, at. Um, at that time, so they don't. They are not really prepared to communicate. They are not. They, they uh, for them the information about uh, uh, that particular vaccine and immunization uh, is not um, comprehensive enough uh, to address the needs of the communities. Um, so that's why we are working on a on a training platform, and uh, we are digitizing. Uh, the learning and uh, training curricula uh, for the vaccinators and for the community health workers. I had a few slides that I wanted to share to see why, why we are working on that. Um, mm, the reason being that uh, in our experience of training health uh, frontline health workers, uh, the time that they spend on uh, gaining knowledge is really minimal. And when uh, it is translated, um, to real actions, there is no monitoring that how do we um, uh, encounter or how do we um, how do they respond to to the issues that they face in, in the field. Um, the paper based training or the classroom level trainings uh, are happening, uh, but they are really inefficient and very costly. Um, we are working with the uh, Department of Health to create uh, uh, learning platforms which are digitized. And hopefully in the future, we'll be able to use them, um, use AI uh, to build in so that these become more engaging, 
these become more uh, informative uh, and they are very user uh, centric so whoever is taking the training uh, the application learns from uh, from the user experience and develops the curricula or um, projects the curricula according to whatever is needed uh, so that's uh, something that we are working on and hopefully in the, in the next uh, year or so we'll be able to implement it and we'll have more information hopefully in the next meeting to, to share with you. Um, these are some of the general uh, information that we have all talked about, so I'm not going to go into the details of it. Um, that how do we work with the, uh, with the communities? Um, in, 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 a, in the context of Pakistan, even if the vaccination coverage is 95%, 5% uh, of children being missed translates is into a large number of people. Um, so almost 300 uh, million people and with a birth cohort of 2.1 percent we translate into 60 million children so 95 percent of 60 million children you can you can do the math uh, these are very uh, scattered across the the communities so if you really have to reach uh, those children who are missed the children who uh, do not have updated uh, immunization uh, vaccination um, uh, vaccinations uh, it's really important for the health system to know where they are um, we are trying to digitize but we also understand that there are many challenges with digitization um, in the past at least two decades Pakistan's immunization program has been working to to have a digital immunization registry uh, it has not been scaled up yet um, uh, the work is still in progress. Uh, so while we are working to digitize this uh, mm -hmm. learning curricula, it also is important to, to work on the motivation um, and helping the healthcare workers understand um, why are, what is their, um, what is the bigger picture? Uh, so we have a center of art-based uh, methodologies and well-being uh, within our organization. We use our uh, artists and take them to the healthcare providers and health workers, where we uh, we engage with the with the health workers, um, um, talk to them, listen to them, uh, help them understand the significance of their work, uh, and it has been really um, critical in 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 our work in the past. Um, the challenge is that it's it's not really scalable, uh, so we are bringing this knowledge into the digital component as well. So whatever information that we are using, we have uh, engaged um, artists, anthropologists, um, design experts uh, to, to look at uh, whatever curricula that we are developing and how useful that can be uh, for the frontline health workers. Um, but that is uh, uh, a perspective that I wanted to share with you guys uh, from, from Pakistan and working with the frontline health workers. So any questions are welcome.